Good evening and welcome to Chasing the Facts. I'm Sam Chase, your host, and with us this evening is Evan Belansky, Director of Community Development for the Town of Chelmsford. And we've asked Evan to uh, uh, be with us this evening to explain a little bit about uh, zoning, what it is, how it works, and the role of a community development office uh, in a town like Chelmsford. So Evan, I'll turn it over to you. We can start with uh, maybe a brief biographical sketch and then we'll get into the discussion. Sure, well thanks Sam for the, uh, <coughs> for the invite. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a privilege to, uh, to participate in, in your show. Thank you. So uh, I've been a uh, uh, working professional for uh, over 20 years. Uh, in a variety of uh, positions. I've been with the town of Chelmsford for 15 years, as you mentioned, as the uh, uh, community development director. Uh, prior to that, I've been with the town of Danvers for five and a half years uh, in a uh, regional planning agency in Boston uh, for uh, several years. Uh, so, you know, regional, uh, local experience, and uh, not surprisingly, I went to school for undergraduate and graduate uh, studies uh, for the uh, field of of town planning, urban planning. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's okay. A, that's a very brief, you know, bio. Well, that's 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 good enough, and so uh, safe to say that you're not a neophyte to the discipline. You exactly. You're exactly. You're, a, you're a seasoned practitioner, as we like to say. Exactly. So. And I would say also that within that uh, realm of study and, and experience, um, you also. Uh, have had a lot of exposure, and it's complementary to planning, I would guess, is economic development. You know, that's part and parcel of that whole Correct. situation. Correct. And that's, that, that's a, has been and continues to be a, mm -hmm. a, a large uh, focus of the, of the position in my work with the town. So, uh, again, your title is Director of Community Development. So, uh, this may be a very broad question, but can you just give us a sort of a snapshot as to what, what exactly does that mean uh, and what are the expectations for your office in terms of um, the, the uh, town activity relative to development, economic development and uh, land use and, and things of that nature? Sure. So the, mm -hmm. the position, uh, what I uh, do for the town is my job responsibilities primarily involve assisting the town in identifying uh, assessing, uh, strategizing, and implementing their goals and objectives related to planning, zoning, economic development, housing, open space, conservation. Uh, so that is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, and I do that by uh, interfacing with uh, regulatory boards, the planning board, the zoning board, conservation commission, assisting the, the select board, working with uh, Center Village Master Planning, uh, North uh, North Village Strategic Implementa Implementation Committee and the Economic Development Committee. So again, at a high level, it's assisting the town in achieving its goals and objectives. And in some cases, that requires me to uh, assist in identifying or teasing out uh, what those goals and objectives may be in the, in the associated strategies. And a lot of that over the uh, last 15 years has been uh, done within the master planning process. And as you know, we've been, uh, since I've been here for the last 15 years, We've undertaken uh, two master plans. The current one is the 2020 update is currently uh, uh, undergoing uh, and is fairly close to completion. What the office does um, is basically any time a uh, proposed development project comes in and requires a permitting with a regulatory planning board, zoning board of conservation, <clears throat> the department uh, is there to um, accept those applications, process those applications on behalf of the, the regulatory boards, uh, and provide uh, staff support, administrative assistance, and technical assistance uh, to those regulatory boards. In doing so, there's a lot of interfacing with uh, the public, uh, abutters who receive notification of a proposed project, attorneys, developers, engineers, other town officials, um, and other appointed and elected officials uh, around the town. Okay, I think that's a very good uh, summary. Uh, let's go back a little bit to the uh, master planning process. So, uh, <clears throat> based on what you just said, uh, the, I'm concluding that the, uh, the plan, so to speak, the development plan, the economic development plan for the town is largely driven by the master planning process. Is that a fair statement? 
And the, uh, if I remember correctly, we're supposed to do a master plan update every 10 years. Correct. Is that right? So since you've been here, you're on your second one. So uh, the master plan, now, as far as the master plan is concerned, uh, we have a master plan committee. Now, who serves on that committee? How do they get there? Uh, what kinds of expertise typically uh, do these people have? And uh, how much latitude do they have in, in developing the master plan? Yeah, so the master planning <clears throat> committee is a subcommittee of the planning board. Okay. So the planning board uh, uh, sought um, uh, designees from a, a variety of committees. Uh, there's a select board uh, designee. There are two members of the planning board. Uh, there are two members of the 2010 master plan uh, committee for continuity. Um, there's a member uh, from the, uh, I want to say the Economic Development Commission, uh, and then uh, several residents uh, at large uh, make up the committee. Uh, so typically, what, what would be the committee membership, the number? Uh, this has, uh, I think, nine. Okay, nine. So it's a good size yeah. committee, and it, and it sounds like a fairly diverse committee, exactly. representatives of the major boards and so forth. But the important thing is that it's a subset of the planning board. Correct. And for folks who may not know it in the audience, in Chelmsford, and this is an important point, the planning board is an elected body. In many towns, the planning board is an appointed board. So in Chelmsford, we have both appointed and elected boards. And the difference, generally speaking, is that the elected board has its own autonomy. So the planning board, for example, does not report to the town manager. Correct. It reports directly to the voters of the town. So if the planning board is doing something that people don't like, there are elections, and presumably people run for office. I can't remember the last time my planning board uh, office went vacant. I mean, there have been times when it's been unopposed, okay? Right. Uh, but <clears throat> that's, that's just so that folks understand the structure and where the authority comes from. So the authority, we can say, generally speaking, comes from an elected planning board, rolls down to the master planning, and then uh, we pick it up from there. And it sounds like a fairly diverse uh, group that uh, is uh, on that uh, committee. Mm -hmm. And they meet typically for how long? Uh, in order to do a, a master plan, it's um, upwards of 12 months, 16 mm -hmm. months, can be 18 months. Uh, this particular process was interrupted due to COVID, um, but they're back, you know, they've been back up and running mm -hmm. and they're probably 90, 95% complete. In fact, uh, uh, the chair of the committee, George Zaharoulis, who was a former planning board member yes. and chaired, uh, was, was involved with the 2010 master plan, will likely be presenting um, kind of a high-level summary mm -hmm. uh, status report to the planning board uh, within the next couple of weeks. So that process is, is wrapping up. Okay. So once that's done, uh, is it fair to say that that now represents sort of a um, blueprint going forward? Um, that's... It's an interesting question. That's the intended goal of a master plan. Mm -hmm. I can tell you that the 2010 master plan served in that capacity, and everything that took place uh, from 2010 to 2020 related to zoning articles were a direct uh, result of recommendations mm -hmm. made in that 2010 master plan. Uh, this, this current master plan is viewed as an update, uh, but a lot has changed. Um, during these 10 years, um, a lot of the, I think a lot of the um, results on the ground um, have had mixed, mixed uh, opinions from board members, past board members, current board members, in the, in the neighborhoods and communities where development has occurred. Um, so moving forward, it's not really clear to me um, how the current iteration of the planning board uh, is going to, whether they're going to accept it as, as as drafted, mm -hmm. or if they're going to uh, take a deep dive and uh, put their fingerprints on it. What is clear to me is that um, even though the master plan as drafted doesn't make any bold statements or changes, it does task the planning board with reviewing all of the zoning, the overlays mm -hmm. and so forth that have been adopted during the last decade 
to review them to determine whether they still um, uh, meet the intended goal or should be revised accordingly. Mm -hmm. So um, that's very interesting. So we're, uh, we're talking about zoning. And I wonder if you could take just a minute to explain to the audience exactly what zoning is and what the, uh, what the intent of establishing uh, different kinds of zoning for different areas of the town. Yeah, so zoning by definition, it's complicated. Um, and it's difficult for a lot of people to, to comprehend. At its simplest form, it's creating uh, land use regulations and law. And by doing so, it's, it's creating property rights and it's taking away property rights. So it, it, it's a legal document and uh, it has um, uh, implications related to being a legal document. Things can be appealed, property owners have rights that are created, as well as abutters uh, have other rights. Ultimately, creating zoning uh, is intended to provide a clear indication to the community, to property owners, to investors, to developers, what the community is amenable, what kind of development, what kind of uses, uh, where are those locations that are amenable, and then providing a, a clear process uh, where um, amenable development uh, is permitted. So in Chelmsford, some development is allowed uh, by right. Much of it requires a special permit. Um, and so it's, it's laying out the rules of engagement uh, so that they're clear and everyone understands uh, what those rules are and how they should be applied. Ideally, zoning laws are, are, should be intended and, and are intended to, to provide some predictability, mm -hmm. send mm -hmm. a clear message to uh, an investor who comes to town and says, I have X millions of dollars to invest. This is my idea. And they look at the zoning and they can determine uh, with some clarity whether that uh, use is permitted and whether that location is permitted and what scope or scale, how big of a development, how many units um, are amenable uh, in Chelmsford. Uh, some of the unique aspects with our zoning in Chelmsford, particularly the overlays, is that it, it, it has taken away a lot of that um, rigidity in typical zoning and has created a, a kind of a flexible model. Uh, and that flexible model uh, was an outgrowth of the 2010 master plan that specifically identified some, some challenges associated with uh, development in Chelmsford. And it, for the first time, it, it coined or defined the term redevelopment. Mm -hmm. So since then, a lot of the, the zoning uh, has been redevelopment focused. So redevelopment might be defined as taking existing structures and repurposing them or uh, repurposing, and, uh, demolishing, and reconstructing, okay. but it's taking existing developed land, whether it's pavement right. or a structure, uh, usually functionally op obsolete, um, mm -hmm. abandoned, uh, derelict, um, or just underutilized. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you know, uh, generally a 30 to 50 year time frame is, is you know, the economic viability right. of, any, of any particular project. Um, so, Chelmsford has a lot of properties, and this was identified back in 2010, of first-generation properties, whether it was on Chelmsford Street, Tingsboro Road, Littleton Road, 129, and trying to figure out a way to incentivize reinvestment. And that's exactly what was, what was recommended, and that's ultimately what, you know, what was proposed mm -hmm. and adopted by, you know, via the overlays by town meeting. So with, uh, with the overlay situation, you've got the, uh, just look at an area in town, doesn't matter what area, but you've got whatever the zoning that's in place for that particular area. And then the planning board uh, proposes to do an overlay to achieve a specific development or an economic purpose, I would say. So what happens when the town says, okay, we will adopt the overlay for that particular area? How does that impact the underlying zoning what supersedes and under what conditions? Mm -hmm. So the underlying mm -hmm. zoning remains in place. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's take, you know, let's take Turnpike Road. Underlying zoning is, is limited industrial. The, the Route 129 business amenity overlay uh, provided kind of additional uh, land use options. And you can kind of visualize, visualize this as the overlay floats over mm -hmm. the underlying zoning. Um, and the, the overlays are something that the town does voluntarily. Again, the underlying zoning is, is what sets the base. 
and an overlay is, is intended to provide a strategic purpose to trying to get a developer to do something different than the underlying zoning. So for 129 purposes, it was introducing multifamily right. along, along Turnpike Road. Um, so if you go back and you look at kind of the planning board deliberations and their strategies and even the you know, hearings and projects that have been built, uh, the planning board you know, made it very clear that underlying zoning uh, would likely result in warehouse distribution. And yet a multifamily project uh, was, as far as the planning board was concerned at the time, was a better fit for that particular neighborhood, meaning it was residential in nature, would, have, would not have created the industrial impacts associated mm -hmm. with a warehouse distribution or an indoor you know, contractor, condo, yard. Um, and so that's the intent, and that's a good example as to how, how a master plan identifies a strategy, zoning's created, and it's crafted to, to uh, achieve a, a very strategic intent. And then the planning board, well, then a developer proposes something because they mm -hmm. get a clear message uh, that the town has a very clear uh, goal in mind. Mm -hmm. And then the planning board holds their hearings and ultimately, in that case, you know, implemented it uh, dating back from a, a decade ago. And I think that's, a, that's an excellent explanation. It's very, very clear. And one of the uh, points that you just made that I'd just like to uh, emphasize a little bit, <clears throat> I don't think folks generally understand uh, what you just said, that the underlying zoning stays in place, okay, so without the overlay, that's what you're limited to, pretty much. So we'll just take, and I don't want to get terribly controversial here, but just as an example, and we'll take the turnpike. So we, we know that when the housing units uh, started to be uh, built and everything, that, that people, some people were not happy with that, simply because a lot of folks just don't like any kind of growth, all right? And I understand that. So, but in following those discussions, and you see it on social media, for example, I don't think I ever saw anybody say, well, wait a minute, folks, if they don't do the housing, you're going to wind up with uh, uh, distribution centers. I don't think I ever saw anybody say that. So I say to myself, well, I wonder if people who are objecting to the housing understand that that's an alternate use that's allowed by the overlay, and if, if it wasn't for that, you might get a developer that comes in here and put something which, and again, it's arguable. Some people like housing, some people like distribution centers, right. you know, whatever floats your boat. But those folks might be less happy with the distribution center than they would be with the housing. I'm not sure people right. get that. They just see housing and they say, I don't like that. Correct. Okay? The bottom line is that if somebody comes in and buys, and I want you to comment on, on what I'm about to say, if somebody comes in and buys a piece of property and wants to do a development and it is consistent with the zoning, then that is a right that has been created for that individual within the zoning. And there probably isn't going to be too much discussion about whether he can or can't do it, as long as whatever his plan is uh, complies in essence, with, with what the zoning says he can do. Is that a fair statement? It's a fair statement. It's a bit mm -hmm. more nuanced than that. Oh, I, I'm uh, sure. In the sense that mm -hmm. many of our uses, particularly multifamily within the overlays, require a special permit from the planning board. And case law is very clear that uh, special permits are given uh, significant uh, uh, legal leeway, mm -hmm. discretion on behalf of a local board uh, to make its make its findings, del del deliberations, and ultimately a decision. So, uh, it, it provides an opportunity uh, for a proposal to be made. Uh, but within that special permit process, uh, the board has a significant leeway in making a, a determination as to mm -hmm. whether to approve, condition, or, or deny. It has to be based upon reasonable facts and findings. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the board certainly has the legal authority uh, to deny specific projects based upon the specific circumstances. So it's not, it's not a one-size-fits-all. Very, very important point. So while your overlay may say on the high level, yeah, you've got the right to come in and do your housing in this particular zone, you can't do anything until it's reviewed by the board and you do need permission from us because we want to make sure that whatever your plan is, 
fits whatever our vision is, is basically. So it's not a uh, it's not a situation where they just automatically get to do what they want. Right, it's not rubber stamp. Even no. even you're right. Even yeah. though it's a it's an allowed use, that use still has to be validated and approved by the planning board before they can proceed. I right. think that's a very important point. Not sure people understand uh, that. Agreed. So, yeah, yeah, I mean, as part that's of the, as part of this <clears throat> the. Uh, the planning board process, whether it's a by right or a special permit, mm -hmm. it's a rigorous review. Um, you know, all drainage is, is reviewed by the town engineer. Traffic is reviewed by the uh, police department. Um, the planning board is undertaking reviews related to the architecture, the lighting, the landscaping, where parking is located, making sure it's safe. Uh, the planning board has the authority to, to review uh, massing and bulk related to architecture and materials. Mm -hmm. So the overlays that have, been in that have been put in place over the last decade have given the, the planning board all of the tools they could possibly need or want to get the development that they want. And you know, I think part of, the, part of the disconnect is that I know for certain that uh, all of the planning boards that have approved projects over the years at the time were able to articulate and justify mm -hmm. their reasons for approval. As years go by and members change, uh, a lot of that institutional knowledge disappears, which is what's fascinating about the elected, you know, bringing us back right. to an elected board. It changes, uh, and elections have consequences. And I think we're, you know, we're beginning to see um, a change uh, in how uh, the current iteration of the planning board. Mm -hmm. Views master planning, views uh, views zoning, views the overlays, and ultimately uh, uh, using their discretionary power related to uh, approving or denying special permits. So as we speak, I think kind of the way we've been doing business is changing, um, and ultimately that 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 sends a message out to the, mm -hmm. uh, the the development community, the investment community. Right, and 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 that's what you achieve again, with an elected board. And I've, I've always uh, looked at, I've, it's funny because, you know, you, you look at these things and you think about it and maybe you go back and forth on the way things ought to be. And, and for me, the planning board is one of those things. Now, I know in a lot of towns it's an appointed board. But what you'll find is that <clears throat> in some of your suburban towns, the planning board may be an appointed, but they're appointed by the, by the select board. So that's sort of a hybrid. So you've got, uh, it's not a situation where one person, town manager, appoints, but you have an elected authority that appoints the board. Correct. So that's a little bit of a, a more of an, electo, uh, an electoral type control, if you will, for lack sure. of a better word. But in Chelmsford, we have, again, as I said beginning, we have a situation where the planning board is directly elected by the voters. So, um, and in my uh, experience, watching the planning boards over the years and the types of projects, uh, the planning board takes what some would say, what developers I'm sure would say, an ungodly amount of time <laughs> to arrive at their conclusion. But that's all for the benefit of the community. So during that whole process, that whole review process, uh, and you mentioned the review by the uh, various agencies, the police, the fire, uh, conservation, and so forth, uh, all of which have to be positive before something can move forward. There is plenty of opportunity, if I'm right, please tell me. If I'm mm -hmm. wrong, please sure. tell me. There's plenty of opportunity for public input as well during that process. So can you describe yeah, the, a little the, bit how that sure. works? I mean, the, the Mass State Zoning Law requires uh, public hearings. They define public hearings. Mm -hmm. All the butters within 300 feet are required to receive notification of a public hearing. Those, those abutters in 300 feet are defined as having legal status uh, within, within the mass court system. Uh, but anybody um, outside of 300 feet, pro, you know, for or against, mm -hmm. uh, has the right to speak uh, at a planning board meeting. They can provide written testimony, oral testimony. Uh, it certainly has been a challenge during COVID. Uh, but we, the board and, and staff and the community you know, did the best we could. Uh, I think uh, starting uh, next meeting, the planning board will be back at a good in-person in session. So that should help uh, everybody involved. Uh, but yeah, there's ample time uh, for uh, members of the community uh, to express their opinion. 
the planning board at, at every meeting uh, allows for public input. Um, but you, 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 mentioned, you, know, you mentioned a good point. The board has to manage uh, their time mm -hmm. as they're meeting. Uh, and so they have busy agendas. Uh, and very often they'll tell uh, the community and the interested parties that we're not making a decision tonight. But as you said about zoning, development is also a, a complicated matter for residents. Many aren't familiar with it. And they get involved in, you know, one time when it's something that's of interest to their particular neighborhood and they get right. a crash course in town, you know, town government and planning board business and public hearings. And uh, so staff and the board spend a lot of time trying to explain the process so that everybody's aware that this isn't going to be decided overnight. It's not going to be decided in one night. It will take multiple meetings to come to mm -hmm. a decision. And I've seen many cases where a project starts off as one thing and the finished product is vastly different. And usually it's a result of, of, of the review process and the inputs and, and, you know, what the planning board feels is doable and appropriate for a particular area. And, and a lot of it's also based on uh, public input. I've seen public input change the direction Absolutely. frequently. Yep. And, that's, and that's the way the process is designed designed to work. So, uh, Evan, we've got about three minutes to go. Uh, this is a very fast half hour. I, I want to take just a second and touch upon uh, affordable housing 40B. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say in, in that regard? Yeah, so, mm -hmm. you know, uh, I'm aware of the public sentiment. I'm aware of multifamily mm -hmm. fatigue. Uh, <laughs> what I, what yeah. I would say to the, to the community, and I think, you know, people on the Housing Advisory Board are aware of this, Every single one of those 40B projects that the town either willingly or had to approve over the last decade, plus whatever projects were approved under the overlay, were needed to reach 10%. So while you may not like the way they look, or you may not like the location, one, they were all um, uh, consistent with the uh, plan production affordable housing plan. Mm -hmm. So that's what the town's strategy was related to location. Which, which the state requires that we have in place. Yes, Correct? Uh, requires we, we, we in have sense. to have uh, we have to have the production plan. Yes, right. So uh, they were all required in order right. to reach ten percent, and those were over the last decade. Uh, those were you know up, upwards of eight hundred units. Mm -hmm. uh, but that was the that was the goal the town set out because it was so important to the town to get control and management of of uh, the predatory forty Bs that it aggressively plan production and a commitment. Mm -hmm. Uh, to zone and approve uh, reasonable 40Bs. So you know, I think that's, I think a lot of the, the current um, uh, public sentiment relates back to right. 40B. Setting, w once you set 40B aside, not much has changed within the last 25 years. If you look at a map of the town or you drive around town, other than those 10 or 12 40B projects, physically not much has changed. We've had a, a, a very, um modest increase uh, with this last census i think uh, we picked up what about 800 people or something yep. like that but but really in the last 10 to 12 years uh, the the numbers in terms of population have been rather flat static uh, between 34 and 35,000 exactly people and most uh, and there aren't too many uh, opportunities left for undeveloped land to be developed at this point so, uh, and one of the initiatives that we have undertaken in the town is, is redevelopment, as we talked about earlier, the 129 initiative and so forth. And, and uh, I wish we had more time to get into that. So what that means is that we're going to have to have you, you back. I like and the we idea will have, of that. We, uh, we will have you back, believe me, because there's an awful lot more information I think uh, would be uh, useful for people uh, uh, to have. As you said, uh, a project comes up, it directly impacts a person all of a sudden they have to get a crash course in, in an area that's highly technical and very legally complex. And it's not easy for folks. So I think the more information we can get out there to the community about land use, development, what is and what is not possible, what role that town officials have and so forth, I think it's only benefits everybody. So Evan, thank you very thank much you, for being on the show and we will have you back uh, very soon. Thank you. Thank you.